right. So Brian, welcome to the podcast. I just thought I would reach out to you because I, one of the things that I love is just hearing stories about people's spiritual experiences, because that's the first thing that really interested me in metaphysics and spirituality was just my own paranormal experiences. And one thing that I've noticed, or actually one thing that I've heard is that people are like, well, I I can believe maybe one ghost story or one encounter with a UFO, but when I'm listening to somebody who's had so many, it's hard to believe. And I'm always telling people it's actually the opposite. Like people who've had one experience tend to have many, many more just because they're open to it or they're an energetic match for it. And you're one of those people that just strikes me as probably an energetic match for all kinds of different experiences. And so I thought maybe we would have some fun today and you could share some of those experiences with us and we can kind of talk about what you think about them. Sure. I um, I just made a few notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love a note. Because I, I love an organized note. <laughs> well, I don't know how organized they are. I tried to go in year order from the first that I can remember to the most recent, but some of them are kind of all over the place. But yeah, I'm very, very excited. And thank you so much for having me. Always. So humble. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, I'm, I'm excited. I want to hear all the things. So I figured we would just kind of start maybe, I guess we could start at the beginning. Like, okay. if you, did you have experiences when you were a child? And Yes. So my first experience that I can remember, I was, I believe, six. So this would have been, well, I'm not going to tell you the year, <laughs> but I was very young and it was the 70s. But I had an imaginary friend and I played with her in my closet, under the bed, you know, wherever, you know, she had a place at the table and she was my little friend. And I had her for, I mean, probably since I was at least maybe four and a half, maybe five and I just remember, you know, playing with her and my mother and my father were just like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. They kind of, you know, brushed off. Although my mother was intuitive and I think she had a feeling, but didn't want to foster that in me because that was sort of my grandmother's thing. She wanted to do that for me. My mother kind of really didn't have a lot of interest. I think she had a bad experience. But um, one particular day I was downstairs at the kitchen table having a snack and my grandmother happened to be visiting that night and they were making dinner. And I was having a little, little snack, a little sandwich. And my grandmother asked me about my friend. And I said, oh, yeah, I was just playing with her upstairs because I giggle and laugh and carry on because we were, you know, having a conversation. And she said, well, what's your friend's name? And I said, Beth Ann. And my mother dropped the dish that she was holding in her hand and just turned around and looked at me with this like aghast look on her face. And then she looked at my grandmother, my grandmother looked at her, and then they looked at me. And my grandmother said, what was her name again? I said, Beth Ann. So she asked me to kind of describe her and talk about her and that sort of thing. And I said, well, I said, she looks a lot like you, mommy. And, you know, of course, you know, my friend might be, you know, someone like my mother, because I adored and idolized my mother. So they asked me some more questions like, you know, do you know how old she is? Where is she from? And I said, well, I pointed to my mom. She's from you. She's like, I don't understand. I'm like, she said she's from you. Like, I didn't really know what that meant. So she said, well, tell me more about her. And I said, well, she said, you have a lot of her things in the box. Well, the box was a cedar chest that was at the foot of their bed. And it was locked, never could get in. It just, I thought it was like furniture kind of thing. Well, lo and behold, you know, a little trip upstairs and the cedar chest was full of things and a picture and a little handprint and a footprint from my sister that died four years before I was born. Wow. And we didn't know we had a sister. You didn't? No. So, um, and she never identified herself as my sister that I can remember, but she was just there and we played and it was lovely. And what happened was my dad was in the military. They happened to be in South Carolina at the time. And my mother got pregnant. She had the baby and she was born and they lived there and she died a few years later and she's buried there. And they you know, had since left, went around a bit and then ended up in Pennsylvania and never, ever talked about it. It was just a, nobody talked about it. And if they did, certainly not when the children were around. So I had no knowledge of this. And that was a huge family meeting because my mother called my father 
told him he needed to come home from work. They need to have a chat. And my grandmother, I guess, had mentioned to my mom, she always had a feeling I was going to be sensitive in that way. And this was it sort of emerging itself. And she was my friend probably, I'd say another year or so. And then, you know, many other things started happening. And I think I, either the need or the, the, maybe the lesson in that sort of did what it needed to do. And it got me sort of to the next phase or next step. And I have never seen her again. Never. Which is kind of sad because I, I have always, when I found out about her, I, I just always felt a void. Like, well, what if, you know, she would be this old, she would be doing this, probably doing that, you know, we would have probably been very close, like all these things. And, and I always have some sense of, you know, I missed out on something. So you said you had a place for her at the table. Like, what kind of things do you remember doing with her? And when you were doing things, like, was she, did you see her with your actual naked vision? Or was it, like, just a sense of her? Like, did you know what she was dressed in? Like, Yeah. What? So sometimes it was more auditory. At night, when I was should be sleeping, I would hear her and she would talk to me. And, you know, giggle, joke, you know, kid things. Um, but when we would actually play together, I, I, when I saw her, it was sort of in my mind's eye, but yet I, I had a, a very good sense of what she looked like and what she was wearing. And she had on this, um, it kind of looked like a sort of a christening gown. I, I don't know how to describe it. It was, but it was kind of long and flowy and she sort of floated more than walked kind of, she just, where I was, she just was kind of like there. And she was generally in front of me to my right slightly. And then my grandmother said there were times when she saw her and she was behind me to my right. So your and, grandmother saw her too. Yeah. My grandmother was, we can get into that later too, but she, <laughs> she did a um, little voodoo, a little hoodoo, a little witchcraft. Um, oh. She was very much into a lot of that. She was incredibly psychic. So was my mother. I mean, my mother had the psychic cross. She she just knew everything and you always wondered how, but it's probably why. Well, can you explain to us what the psychic cross is? Well, from my understanding, it is, it's a, um, I have one here, it's a small one, but it is, it is an X on your palm and it just is denoting psychic ability. Um, to what degree they, you know, some palmists will say if it's like huge, the entire, you know, you're massive. If it's little, might not be as at that time as nurtured or as formed. Um, it's really weird. I have it on both palms, and it's right involved. Well, my on my right, it's to the right, and then in my left, it's smack dab in the middle. So I've got it on both. Wow, how interesting! Now I'm looking at my palms. Where are yours? Um, I don't know that I have. I'm well. I do have an X in my left palm, right in the center. But in the right one, it, it, I don't really have one. I, I've got like lines that veer up and then go uh -huh. the, to the other direction and then veer up again. So yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I do palmistry a long time ago. I, I barely know anything. I know your children are over here. That's about all I remember. I've never, I've never, di I've never done palmistry or even had my palms read. So I'm interested. That's interesting. Yeah, that should be interesting. Hmm. So, so that was that story. Yeah. So your grandmother was very psychic. Your mom yes. was psychic, but maybe not as actualized. And then here comes little Brian, all psychic. <laughs> little Brian that all wants to do is just talk and carry on and tell all about these wonderful adventures that I'm having with spirits and nobody really wants to listen. <laughs> They're just like, shut up, Brian, go away. Because <laughs> I was always having something odd going on. So when you, when you were encountering these things as a child, were they comforting or, or were there things that were kind of frightening and scary? Uh, there were some, um, not so much when I was a kid, kid. I had one experience, um, probably six, seven months, maybe after the whole sister thing was kind of happening. I, to this day, I, I don't, it's very weird. I'll, I'll explain. And then you can, you can go into it with, with what you will. I was going to bed that night and I went to bed, but I did not sleep. I was just laying there. I was very restless. And I felt kind of like something was looking over my shoulders. It didn't feel like, like my sister. It didn't feel like anything I'd ever encountered before. I know that I felt uncomfortable. I don't, I'll stop short of saying I was scared, but I was apprehensive and I didn't want to go to sleep. 
So I just laid there. Well, then all of a sudden I felt this tingly vibration sort of in my solar plexus area and it sort of resonated through my whole body. And the next thing I know, I am up, levitated out of bed and I am literally flat zipping through my door. Like my door was open, but through there, down the stairs, into the kids, our stair, like you went out of my bedroom, kind of a left down the stairs, you landed in the kitchen, like at the back of the kitchen. And then, then you could kind of go that way, go through the kitchen. And I was going in this light and I over the table and through the window, like through the window and up, 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 up. And I remember going up was very fast through the house felt like it took nine years. It was so slow. And I'm like, you know, I could see my dog and my dog's like, you know, and my cat's meowing. It was the weirdest thing. So wait, every- wait, wait, did you, <clears throat> are you saying that your animals sensed you and saw you when you were floating from around? From my perception, yes. Mm-hmm. Because again, my family thought it was a dream, but I felt like it was very real. And, and my dog was like looking around and he was whining and following. And my cat was just like, you know, she's meowing. Then she hissed and ran. Dog followed me all the way to the window and out and then up and the up was like the fastest elevator and and it it felt cold but not freezing but it was very cold and it was um not windy but it i had a sense of air i don't i don't know how to describe it it was just like a rush of cool air and then i remember nothing else except waking up in my treehouse and my treehouse is locked so we had a tree house that was built in our cherry tree and we could go into the, we had steps to get in, but when we were not in there, it was padlocked. I didn't have the key. My mother or father had the key, but I woke up in the tree house. They couldn't so, find me. They were looking for me and I was nowhere in the house and they were about to call the police and I'm screaming, I'm in the tree. Like I had no idea how I got there. So wait a minute. So when you were starting the story, it sounded like you were having an out of body experience, right? levitating out of body, floating around, going up, but you actually ended up physically in the tree house, in the locked tree house, which you would have not been able to open because it was bad. And I'm believing that it was an UFO ET interdimensional experience. And I'm, I'm very adamant. Like I've always felt that that's what it was. And, you know, my mother's yelling at my dad, you didn't lock the tree. I never opened it. And I wasn't even in the tree that day. So Wow. And, you know, and you could, you could, you could go outside, you could climb up, but you couldn't get in. So there'd be no other way to get in there unless you had, you know, opened the lock and it swung open. I'm sorry. How old did you say that you were at the time? Between six and seven. I think I was turning seven that summer. So a couple of weeks before seven. That's interesting because like when I hear, for example, Whitley Strieber who wrote communion and he's an oh, alien abductee and love that movie. Um, yeah. When I've heard him talk about his abduction experiences um, and, uh, you know, how physical they were, I'm I'm always thinking in the back of my mind, that sounds like it's happening, though, in the astral dimension, like in the fourth dimension, like the the seeing the grays in your room, yeah. feeling the, the body kind of getting sucked up and out. Like that all feels like an out of body experience. Like, is it actually happening in happening in the physical? But like Whit Whitley suffered actual injuries. You know, he he went to a doctor and the doctor said, "Well, you've been you've been raped," and the way he remembered it is he was probed like an alien encounter. He was probed. So I'm like, is there some weird uh, intersection between the fourth dimension where this is, I believe, happening, and the physical? And so when you're saying you're kind of having that out of body experience, but then you're waking up in the physical in the treehouse. Like that's bizarre. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And no one can make sense of it. Even my grandmother, the most, you know, psychic person I knew at the time, she, now she, I will say she, at first when I was describing, thought I was having an out of body and she was trying to kind of explain in, in a way, I guess a child could understand what that might be. And then I explained, but the dogs, but then again, you know, animals are sensitive. They can see that. But then how do I wake up in the treehouse that's locked and there's no other way in. And Whoa. even to get to like the window on like the treehouse, it was like a condo, a couple floors and you could kind of go through the floor to the next place. But the window was way up. I mean, there's no way, there's nothing even to grab onto to get into that. So I, I can't explain it other than I, I feel like I was literally taken. But you don't have any sort of impressions of 
little aliens or being in a room or anything like that? I will say as I got older and spent time meditating on it, but then you think about, I've seen, uh, you know, years after that, I saw, you know, close encounters. I've seen communion. I've seen movies. So I don't know, you know, I, I mean, as, as I've been meditating, you know, years and years ago, I've had flashes of what could be that experience and not seeing myself, but seeing it from my, from my eyes. And, and I, I felt fearful, but not terrified, um, uncomfortable, unsure, um, scared because in, in a way that I just, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. And I remember in my head thinking, I need my mother. Where's my mother? And I do remember something near me sort of putting their hand on me and getting um, a, a sense of, you don't have to be afraid. You don't need your mother. This won't be very long. Like that, that I remember, but I don't, I don't say I saw a gray or any, I saw shapes. I saw a shadow. Um, I, I felt, I don't want to say drugged, but a little confused, a little out of it. And I don't know if that's just being so young, having this experience, adrenaline, you know, and, and not understanding the surroundings. And I'm someone who at that time needed to be in my comfortable surroundings to feel secure. So I felt very insecure. So when I get in those modes, I'm not super cognizant of what's going on. I'm in panic mode kind of in my head. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So I, in, uh, I'm very interested in abduction and trying to really figure out what's going on with that. But it's very common for sedation to occur and actually to be touched and then have sort of a euphoria or sedation to occur. Um, but, but that's interesting. Another thing that tends to happen with folks who have these types of encounters is that this runs in the family. There's usually somebody else in the family who's also having similar type encounters and, and not necessarily just psychic encounters, but also alien encounters or, or have seen a UFO before. Do you know if your mom or your grandmother or anybody My else? Okay. And, and it's funny because for maybe about a year and a half, maybe two years after that, we traveled a couple of times a year to Washington, DC to see a friend of my dad's who he was in the military with. And my mother was friends with his wife. And we would go down and visit them, you know, a couple hour drive, head down. And we would always see a UFO. And always when I was with my mother, but my mother was always cagey about it. Like Nancy, the, the, my mother's friend would say, there's one. And we would look and my mother would just kind of look the other way. She tense up and, and she'd kind of, you know, not like fetal, but she would go into something that, that was, it was uncomfortable. And as a kid, I never liked to see my mother like that, but I always had the sense that she was afraid of that. And I wonder her reticence of, of me being involved in anything like this was always from some type of bad experience. Could that have been something she did suffer from night terrors for a long time? Could that have been some of what was going on maybe, but she never talked about it. Yeah, that's interesting to hold yourself like that. Just she, um, I mean, she's she in the passenger <laughs> side and she like grabbed the side and she just and then her arms went right up and she just like like so defense like it like a child. Did it happen maybe when she was a kid? You know, she was born in the 40s mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s. These things were happening all over. Possibly could be juxtapose that with the story my mother tells. She's she's <laughs> riding. She's driving in a car with her mother who was completely cuckoo bananas metaphysical but also like drunk all the time but <laughs> she just wanted to my grandmother I know, she just wanted to check out and go off planet she was over it and so my mom was driving somewhere in southern california and it was like on a, a lonely kind of deserted road and they both saw a ufo and my mom couldn't believe it she was freaking out like probably most of us would be freaking out by seeing this but her mother was like, stop the car, let me out. She's like, got her hands out to the <laughs> UFO, take me with you. And my mom just sped up and wouldn't stop the car because her mother was literally like, I, I want to go, take me with you. That was, that was my family. But I would go, I told my second grade teacher on the first day of class, if I'm ever, now this is clearly just me embellishing, but I said, if I'm ever late, it's because I am on a spaceship and I just lost track of time. That story has haunted me my entire life. Three years ago, I was home visiting family. Um, well, 
about two years ago, right before my mom got diagnosed. And um, I ran into my second grade teacher, Miss Myers. She's a little lady, a little hunchback. She's so cute. Always ate an apple. And she's like, oh, are you in from a spaceship, Brian Fisher? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. It, it, my brother even just a couple of days ago brought that story up again. I said, well, you know, I really was abducted and that could have been a thing. Just saying. I did, you know, funny. Now I remember one time I was sitting out on our deck and it was late and I should have already been in bed. And my mother looked out. She's like, what are you doing? I was looking up at the sky and I said, I just want to go home. And I remember my mother saying, but you are home. And I'm like, the other home. Well, she thought I meant the first home that we lived in. I kind of think I was talking about out there. Some star system that you were yes. looking at at the yes. time. You, you just brought back a really wow. nice memory. Because after that, my mother took me to the house, gave me cocoa, sat with me, held me, told me she loved mm -hmm. me. This was our home. Don't I ever leave her. And I said, I'll never leave you. <laughs> oh, your mama. Yeah. That is so yeah. sweet. But then yeah. again, too, maybe from her framework, maybe she's got some cellular memory herself. And so she yeah. completely maybe identifies with what you're doing, sitting out there looking up at the stars. Yeah. And I felt at peace. I was, I just felt a sense of longing. Like, where are you? I'm here. Like I could have had my suitcase back. Like I was so ready at that moment. Well, I have to share with you and, and we're here to hear from you, but I have to share with you this out of body experience that I had uh, many moons ago, it must've been 2010. It was quite some time ago. <clears throat> and I was reading a lot of out of body literature and I was just filling my consciousness and awareness with that subject in specific. And that has always been for me what works in terms of inducing those types of experiences, just like day and night filling myself with it. Usually within a few weeks, I'll have an OBE. So anyway, I was doing that for quite some time, probably about two weeks, just every night before going to bed, I'd read a bunch of stuff. And then I think about it, I'd have the intention I'd go to bed. And so one morning I was about to wake up, I found myself kind of out of body. And I turned around, I saw myself in the bed and I realized, oh shit, it's, it's happening. Here we go. I'm out of body. I'm, I'm in my bedroom. I'm looking around. And I immediately, just like in life, I wanted to see myself in the mirror. <laughs> so I floated, I floated over to this big mirror that I had. And it was so bizarre because I could see a reflection. I'm in 4D. I'm in the astral. I could see a reflection of myself and I was naked. My light body was naked, no clothes. And I was turned around. So I was actually looking at me arse. I was looking at me arse hovering probably about three to four feet above the ground. I was kind of in fetal position and with my bum toward the mirror. But I, at the same time, I was also looking at my, like I could see 360. I could see in every wow. direction. Like I, I didn't have eyes in my butt to see, you know, so I was, I could see, <laughs> that I could you see know all of. around me. Right. Um, and so that was really curious because I was backwards and, and it was, it was very bizarre. I then decided to move about the house. And so you said it took you so long to get out of your house. And I actually remember moving through the walls and feeling the density of those walls. Like it was, it slowed me down a little bit. And then I popped out into the loft and I, I gained speed. I remember floating above the railing of the loft and then kind of just zipping down below into the living room where my dog was. And she looked up from where she was sleeping and she was just watching me float around and she barked at me. So she 100% and I was calling to her. I was like, hi. And she was interacting with me while I was in spirit. And so that was all very cool. So animals do see you like that. I ultimately ended up back in my bedroom and um, I started to get this sense of a presence that was approaching. And my theory is that when you pop out of your body into the astral and you don't immediately kind of get into your sovereignty and into your power, like that whole ecosystem notices you. And some of it's good, but not all of it's good. Yeah. And I had the distinct sense that something had taken notice of me and something was approaching. And I could actually feel them coming up the stairs up to the loft. I could feel the presence right outside of my door. And at this point, I started getting really afraid and trying to jam myself back into my body. Like, wake up, Crystal. Wake up, wake up, wake up. And I was literally screaming at myself to wake up because something was coming through the doors. And I woke myself up and... 
I never knew what it was that was coming into the space, but it was just a wild, that was one of the most wild out of body experiences I've ever had, but my dog definitely saw me and you definitely do feel it when you're moving around the physical reality and going through walls or like going through furniture. Like there's a, there's a specific density to that. I had my first OBE when I was a teenager, my friend Crystal and I were dabbling in witchcraft because, you know, my grandmother did. Of course I did. She taught me. Every crystal does. Absolutely. Absolutely. She's crystal with a K. Um, But same crystal, right? I mean, it's that same kind of fierce, fiery energy. And I said, let's, let's practice. Cause I was, I was all in. I'm like, my grandmother taught me things. Her mother, you know, was involved in witchcraft. She obviously was. So I'm like, I'm going to try to have an on-body experience. And I tried, tried, tried. Well, I thought I did. And I popped out and I'm floating heading towards her house and I'm going through the neighborhood. And she lived probably about four blocks away. And I'm just, floating around and I'm seeing like things that are going on. I saw my neighbors playing like wiffle ball and I saw some other people on some janky, like, like metal skate skating in the street. Like I just saw what people were doing at the time. And I'm like, like friggin' A, this is fantastic. And I'm like, Oh, flying, you know, I get to Crystal's house and I zip through and kind of like, it felt dense, you know, zipping through, but then all of a sudden it's like, like you're there. And I see her on the sofa wrapped in this blanket and she's, and I hear the Andy Griffith theme. And I look at the TV and there's Andy Griffith. It's starting and I see what's going on. And I go over and I like try to tap her. And of course in Astro, I don't think I made a obviously a physical connection, but I tried to tap at her and she pulled up and she did like that right where I was. And then just looked back at what she was doing. And she's like, I got to call Brian like out loud. And then the next thing I know, I'm like awakened in my room and the phone's ringing and it's crystal. And she's like, did you do it? And I'm like, I think I did. And she's like, well, what happened? And I said, I was floating through the neighborhood. I got to your house and you were watching, you were wrapped up on the sofa with a blanket watching Andy Griffith. And I could hear Andy Griffith talking in the background. She said, that's exactly what's happening. Wow. That was the only time I literally like laid in bed and said, I'm going to do this. And it happened. Whoa. Yeah. And it's never happened like that again. I've had them, but not from just, I'm going to do it right now. You know? (laughs) Right. Yeah. That was wild. That was, I think I want to say it was 16, 15 or 16. It's intense. Yeah. Well, and also you're, you're, you're so young and your pineal gland is not totally calcified because of all the years of hard living that we do by the time we're our age, 22, (laughs) but like your pineal gland is still like vibing, you know? And so you can do things like astral project upon will, and you can do things like have mediumistic experiences because you're still so connected in that way. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, go on. We want to hear more. Let's see. Um, oh, another sort of, now this is a little demonic, if you will. Around about the same time Chris and I are doing our things, we were trying to conjure demons from the nine realms of hell and anything vile and evil we could because, well, at school we were known as like, you know, the witches of Eastwick. <laughs> and we let it be known that we were doing these things. And I will share something with you, maybe off camera, because I'm not sure if anyone's ready to hear it, but something that we did. But um, anyway, one of the things that we did is- They are going to be dying to know what this is. Okay, maybe I'll tell you at the end, because I'm not proud of it. It's not, it's not, it's not a very proud moment. I've had terrible karma because of it, um, Mm -hmm. but, but, but we can get into that. But so this particular time we, um, we were trying to conjure and we thought we got something, but we weren't sure, you know, we, we thought it was there, but it wasn't. So we don't know what happened. Well, we were bum fuzzled and confused and we never closed our happy little circle. So we didn't send whatever we brought in back that particular three or four month period. We had all kinds of disturbances in my home and paint was peeling from my ceiling in my room roundabout where we were doing what we were doing. So of course we go up into the attic, nothing leaking, nothing going on, paints peeling, not sure what's happening. Um, my wall started peeling and, and it's just started crumbling and you could hear breathing like coming from in the walls when I would go to bed at night, it was the creepiest thing. And my mother's like, I think that might be the furnace. I'm like, but the furnace is on that wall. (laughs) So, but then at night you'd hear like, like, you know, footsteps, and like heavy breathing and not necessarily moaning, but just like, uh, like weird groaning, like gas, or I don't know. It was very weird. And my mother said she felt uncomfortable in the house. She wanted to move. Like she wanted to get out of the neighborhood. Crystal conversely was having things 
strange things happening at her house, not to the level that I was, but it was like, I'd have something go on. Maybe the next night she would. And both of us were not pork eaters, but we were craving pork. And when I tell you I was craving pork, I wanted bacon every day, pounds of it. I wanted pork chops. I wanted ham steak. Like I wanted to eat pork constantly. And it was when these things were happening. And then the night that it wasn't happening, I didn't, pork made me sick. Like I'm like, oh, I can't even stand the thought of it. But I'm telling you, my mother made pork chops. I'm like, make me four. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. Pork, pork, pork. So we're at Crystal's and she's explaining things. And she said, and you know, the weirdest thing, I'm craving pork. She's like, I don't eat pork. And I'm like, you know, so that was a connection there. Well, then it happened. Something was in the woods across from her house staring at us. We could see the eyes and it was breathing and moaning and, and, and it was otherworldly. It was not human. It didn't sound human. It didn't feel human. It was beastly. It's the only way I can describe it. And I've never had a sense of terror and horror in my life like that. And what did we do? We went into the woods. <laughs> You're not going to get us. And this thing, I mean, it was beast-like. It was a shadow shapey with glowing eyes, but it communicated on a quasi-human level. Wait, like, <laughs> this, okay. is so cool. this is so okay. awesome. So like, are you talking like Bigfooty? No. Because I believe um, Bigfooty is interdimensional. And yes, not- I, okay. I have I have a Bigfoot for you too. <laughs> of course I do, Pennsylvania, but I do. No, this was, I mean, you know, if we're going to look at Hollywood for a moment, it was demonic. It was a demonic creature. It, if you want to say what it kind of shaped like, it was, it, it, its arms and legs were elongated, quasi human like, but its body was weird and it was thicker. And it, I mean, it kind of looked devil like, if you will, sort of quasi werewolfy, beastly, but, but, not human, but not, not human. It was, it was such a weird hybrid thing, but it was mostly shadow and you could catch glimpses. It was just the most weird looking thing, but it was scary as you know what. Mm-hmm. And, um, and at that moment, like we're, we're, you know, you can't have us, you know, what do you want? And it pointed to crystal. It, it like pointed at her and she had issues with it for years and we tried so many times to send it back we got her mother involved we got my grandmother involved and i think between all of us we finally got it back because no one has seen or heard from him since but one day three or four years ago not kidding i was laying in bed and it kind of popped into my head like that was a wild time i went to the kitchen without even thinking and made a pound of bacon not kidding and i i'm not a pork eater at all i don't eat pork now, had you summoned a specific demon that you were, like, was there one that you were trying to work with or were you? I want to say, if I remember correctly, because this was many moons ago, I want to say we were trying to get Astaroth, but I don't think that's who we got. Well, I don't know. what about this theory of, could what you in- have encountered be a projection of the energy that you guys were trying to summon inside of yourselves too. So if you're hundred percent, it very well could have been, could it have just been like an out picturing of what's happening? Cause you can create a thought form, right? right. With we could energy. have created like a poltergeist kind of situation and, you know, left unchecked, it had a mind of its own. And a and, thought form will look for a host. Yeah. And crystal was probably, you know, most of the times when, when he, it would come around, was when we were realizing it was generally when she was on her friendly visitor for the month. And, and, but I never understood why I was involved in that. I mean, not that I had a period, but I mean that, um, that I was so like, it was happening at my house during that week too, but it was like a night here, a night there. It was, I don't know if it's because we raised that energy together. Cause you guys have cords, you guys in Hawaii, yeah. we call those Aka cords. So you guys yeah. are connected and, and we, we sure are. You can send energy, but you can also send entities along the cords. And so if you're connected in the cords and you're, ha- and you both have that intention, then it doesn't surprise me that you would have the yeah. same experience. And if it's associated with her time of the month and it's like hormonal and definitely polter can be poltergeist. Yeah. It was so wild. She had an attachment for years then. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Crazy. Crazy. Moral of the story. Don't try to summon demons. It's no, not well. please don't. Please don't. Cause we tried it again. Cause you know, that's what we did. But this time was with a Ouija board. <laughs> Cause you know, that's the one thing you absolutely should play with. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think you can safely if you do the right thing. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, my mother had one specially made for me, which was beautiful. It was four years ago. I'll dig it out and I'll send you a picture. It's um, it's it's a black cat like our cat, and um, and it's out in a field and there are leaves and it's like nature and it's glass top. And she I means she went and found somebody to make this for me. Wow. And to me, that was my mother's ultimate way of saying, I finally do accept what you do and how you live your life in in these these realms. And this is my my sort of olive branch. Wow. So yeah, I don't ever use it. It just sits there, but it's it's beautiful. Um, but anyway, um, where's I going with that? Well, you you mentioned you continued oh, the, the Ouija board. So we were playing and playing and trying to get something, and we had you know relatives of hers. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Was yeah, was that you no, or was no, that? No, I'm friend? just getting all, no, I'm getting all crazy. <laughs> But I'm like, you already summoned something. <laughs> yes, and so we more. wanted to do it again because, you know, we didn't learn our lesson. And whatever was happening at that time was in my house. And at that moment, we had like a gust of wind and windows closed, cupboard doors were banging, and all the water in the house turned on. Faucets, toilets flushing, and all the trash cans turned over in every room where there was a trash can just turned over. And you felt like something was chasing you through the house. Well, me being the conscientious witch that I was, I had a circle on my floor in my bedroom. So let's go run in there and hide in the circle. And we did, and it was fine and whatever. But And that's another thing that we had a very hard time getting rid of. And we had odd things happening in the house for a couple of weeks. Oh, that sounds totally poltergeistic. Yeah, it was. And that one, I'd say it was probably about two weeks that it lingered. And then I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I'm like, I, I sort of exerted my dominion, if you will. And said, get out. Like, this can't be. Like, you're now you're taking too much of my life, my family's life. This is not what I intended. You need to go. And it did? It did. It did. Never saw it again or felt it. Did I you know. stop dabbling in those things or did you? Oh, continue? Crystal, you're so adorable. Not for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I still do, but now I kind of, it's more like little candle things and just things to raise good energy and send good vibes to people. Not anything like, like nothing like that ever again now, because now I understand what we're really bringing forth and, and what it does. And, you know, to a kid growing up on Hollywood, well, that just thrills me. Right. I mean, it's exciting as an adult. I'm like, it's not what it's all about. Spirituality is much different than that. It's so yeah, no, but yeah, we had another seance when we were younger um, there was a local witch that lived in our town and we tried to summon her. And when we did on Halloween night at midnight outside and um, lightning struck the, the um, streetlight where we were and it knocked the, the sort of cover off and laying on the ground, which at midnight when there's nothing else going on and that metal clangs, oh my God, it sent through the entire neighborhood. We go running. The wind is like literally chasing us down the street. It was like, it was right behind us. And I go running to my house. My mother's on the phone with my grandmother freaking out because a bat is flying around our house. And she told my grandmother, I hear this as I'm running. I think it's one of the kids. They were having a seance. And I go in the house and she shoves me into the powder room off the kitchen. And they have to get rid of this bat. And they couldn't get rid of it. At one point, my mother had this, I think everyone in the 70s and 80s had these oval mirrors, which had like lattice work at the top and the bottom. The bat was hanging upside down from it. And my dad's like, I'm going to kill it. My mother's like, no, I think it's JR. Because I was already in the house. She thought it was my brother. But so we had that experience. That was that was a lot of fun. That was a small one, though. The pandemonium you visited upon your poor mama and grandma. <laughs> yeah. I, I was full of pandemonium, I, I will say. Wow. Trying to think other fun stuff that I could tell you. Um because I mean, I could go on for nine hours and you don't have that kind of time. I will tell you something that happened in my adult life that was actually interesting. When I was 30, I was working at a company and a benefit services type company, third party benefits administrator. And my office was here and directly above me was the office at our sister company upstairs. We both happened to be um, admin managers. And, and so we would message each other all the time and all that. I didn't know her very well, but she was really sweet. Her name was Tracy. 
And one day I'm just working away and I hear like, it sounded like somebody was like in the rafters, right? And I, I look up and I'm like, I'm like, oh God, do we have rats? Like that's the immediately thing that I thought. Next thing I know, I just see a body fall through with a noose around its neck and hang itself. And I'm like, literally I'm freaking out and I feel like I want to wet myself. I, I mean, I mean, I felt sweat. I, I, I've never experienced that. And I'm looking and he points up and he says, Tracy, and then vanishes. So I call Tracy. They say, hey, Tracy, I'm like, can you come downstairs to my office? She's like, sure, I'll be there in a minute. So she comes down a couple minutes later. And I, at this point, I'm like, you know, because I, I, that happened. I mean, there's no way it didn't happen, right? So I said, I, I think I need you to sit down for a minute. So she sits down, shut the door, all that. They said, do you, I said, first of all, do you, you're going to think I'm crazy, but do you know anyone in your family that may have committed suicide? She turned white, then red, and then tears. She said, my uncle committed suicide last year. Well, I'd only been there maybe six months, so I didn't know her when that happened. And I'm like, she's like, why do you ask? And I'm like, I think he was here. She's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, I kind of explained what happened. And I said, he pointed up and said your name. She's like, oh my God. And I'm like, I, I don't know what this means. This is, hasn't really happened to me like this, but I, I think he might have a message for you. When I said that, I saw him again and he was behind her. And he said, wall, one word, wall. And I said, he's saying wall. And she's like, oh, I don't know what that means. And I'm like, I don't know. And then he said, home. And she's like, well, he was always doing something in the house, tinkering, you know, knocking out walls, plastering, whatever. And I said, that's all he said. I, I don't know. And he's gone now. I said, but that's it. And she's like, okay. But she was, I mean, visibly like shaken. And, and she's like, okay, well, I I'm going to go now. Like trying to act like this is all normal and staggers out. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what the F just happened? And so about three weeks later, I've been wanting every day to ask her. And she, you know, we didn't, and she like avoided me like the plague. She comes downstairs a couple, like three weeks later, says, very interesting. And she opens her purse and she pulls out a letter. And I, I said, may I? She said, of course. I look at the letter. It's a letter from her uncle detailing why he killed himself. And he left a boatload of cash and he put it in the wall for her. Whoa. So she got a boatload of cash and a lovely letter. I mean, it was sad, but whatever. And in that moment, I guess I was there to, to facilitate that. That was my other like wild experience. That's amazing. It was. So, and previous to that, were you, did you know that you had mediumistic tendencies or that you could be a medium or was that like the only time? Or? I No, I had a couple other like minor experiences. And I think, you know, maybe with my sister, that might have been one, you know, kind of the beginning. Right. I've seen other spirits, um, different places. Um, I was um, at my job before that. And I was running out one day. I was so late. I had to get to the airport, catch a flight. I was running. It was, I worked at a retail store. I was running through. I was, um, I was the, the account manager running, 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 running. And I plowed right into a lady. And I mean, I like, well, I didn't plow, but I mean, I like bumped into her and I grabbed her so she wouldn't fall. And when I grabbed her, I said, don't worry, your baby's fine. And then I kept running, got in my car, drove to the airport, had my trip, never thought about it again. A year later, I get called out of my office. There's someone here to see me. Well, I figured it was a family member or friend, you know, because my office was upstairs. So I came downstairs and there's a lady and I'm like, uh oh, somebody's complaining. They decided to get a manager. I'll make it right, you know, whatever. She said, You don't remember me, do you? I'm like, No. And I said, Should I? And she said, Well, she said, You were very hastily running through the store and you, you ran into me. I'm like, I do remember. And I do remember running into someone. And she said, And you said to me, Don't worry, your baby's going to be okay. I didn't remember that. And I'm like, I did. She said, yeah. I mean, I was, I just knew I was running late and I, I had to go cause I don't want to miss my flight. And she's like, baby in a stroller. <laughs> she was pregnant. She was going to our restroom. She was bleeding. Oh, wow. And so she tried to clean herself up and get herself to the doctor. Oh my gosh. And I guess thought she was miscarrying and didn't. Wow. So that was probably the first time I had an aha moment that I'm like, there's more to this than me just seeing something that I think might be something. But now I had an actual experience with another person and something told me that her baby was gonna be okay. And I kind of felt like it was a masculine kind of thing. And I always wondered because I had this feeling 
that it was her husband and he was deceased. I never asked. She didn't say, but that's the feeling that I had. Hmm. I think it was his. Wow. Interesting. That's so cool. And it's, I think it's, it's interesting to note that you were focused on something else entirely, like getting to wherever you needed to go, getting to your car, whatever you were doing. I find that when we're focused like that, it allows this other faculty to kind of come to the fore, you know, and that's where intuition lives. I think this is what Gurdjieff was trying to do when he had people like through labor, like just continued menial labor. It allowed them to kind of detach from what the body was doing and start to float up into these other realms where they could connect at a higher level. I, I know I'm getting all cosmic on you, but like you're really, really hyper-focused on getting getting to the car or bump, you know, you're going somewhere, but that allows you to have this other faculty kind of float up and connect. It's and wild. Bring it, it, yeah. it was wild. I've had um, one other interdimensional something. It was a couple months ago. I was listening to Arcturian frequencies because I, I there's something about them. I, I think I might have had connection before because I feel like I know them. It's so weird. Like, I feel like I'm friends with them. And I know that sounds cuckoo crazy, but, I, but I, feel, I feel such a kinship with them, right? So I was focused on this and I was in my living room. And this is at my new place. Well, my old place, because I've been here a couple of years. But, um, and I'm, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, my arms went up, my head's rolling around. I feel somebody manipulating me, checking me out all over. And I stand and, and they are, and I hear, don't worry. It's okay. We're checking you out essentially. And I'm like, okay. And then that whole experience happened. And that was maybe 15 minutes. And I was so in and out of it. And it's so funny because when I, when they put me back down, Claire jumped on my lap and spread across me and was a very low grade growl. And I'm like, and I remember thinking, it's okay, go over there and lay down, it's fine, don't worry. And she jumped off and went over on her little bed, like she's a good little girl, but I know I didn't say it. And and I got up and I was led into my bedroom and I, I felt like I wasn't even walking. And I'm in my bedroom and I turn and I face the wall. And so like, there's like my slider outside and then there's the wall and I was facing the wall and a shape appeared. And I remember saying, oh, hi, you know, what's your name? And I got, and I couldn't determine the N or the M, but I got Yanos or Yemos. I couldn't, I couldn't quite get it. And thanking me for connecting, thanking me for the interest and said, this was going to be the beginning of an amazing journey together. And I'm just standing there. And then Claire comes in and she just stares. And I just saw like hand go down. And then she just kind of did like that. And then she laid at the feet. And that lingered for five, 10 minutes, maybe, maybe longer, maybe shorter, but it was just a moment where I was not now in my room anymore. I was elsewhere. I was, I, I, I didn't, I didn't see here. I didn't feel here. It was sort of like a void, if you will. It was quiet. It was cool, but not cold. And it was, I mean, I have to, I have to say it, it was like almost maddeningly quiet. I could hear thoughts, but it was quiet. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like it was so quiet, but yet it was like, it kind of reminded me of being in a plane, an airplane at night and you're flying over a city and you see all the little lights and then it's dark and you see all the little lights from the little towns. I felt like I was getting that voices, thoughts, feelings, emotions from these little clusters, but yet everything was so quiet. And it was like sort of in my head. And I'm like, how can I be hearing this when I know there is no audible sound going on here? And I got a sense of from, from that being, this is just part of the experience. Just let it wash over you kind of thing. And then the next thing I know, I'm back on the sofa. So I don't even remember coming back out. And for the rest of the night, I had everything here felt like it was, you know, when you turn something up really loud, it's distorted. Everything here on the earthly realm was distorted, but I could very clearly hear things going on other places. And that was a good three or four hours that happened after that. I went to bed feeling like that and a very low grade hum in my ear. 
Wow. Yeah. And so did that just kind of slowly fade away or do you still have any residual effects? Like if, can you tune into that now if you wanted to? I, I can, but not to the degree that I did. And that's mostly probably because life work, busy, not as focused, but I will be outside because I had this inkling one night to go out like three or four days later and and look up. I felt like they were there, but I know, I, I think they were, but not close because I live over a flight path. It's too busy. So I don't think they would really enter that way. I mean, I know they can pop in anywhere, but I, I felt like they were in craft. And I feel like they wouldn't because of the fact that it is is a busy flight path. And if you're just trying to have me for a moment, there's too much going on. Because I was going to get a laser pointer and like, here I am, fine, you know, come, come. But I'm like, I don't, I don't need that. I know that that it's going to happen again. And I think it's going to be more profound. And I feel like it is coming because now I've got work at a level where it's, it's, it's very much, you know, now it's Monday through Friday, eight to five. I have my nights, I have my weekends. And I feel like I now have more time to concentrate and relax and let go of, I have different responsibilities now. It's not, it's more responsibility in another way, less stressful than my previous work. And I feel like, oh, I get it. And I feel like they know that and they're coming and they're like, we were just waiting on you. Well, let me ask you a question. Okay. <clears throat> So all of these things have happened and now we have this recent thing that's happening, which is really cool. Why do you think it's happening? Like why and and what is your response going to be? How do you use it? How does it help? In other words? Well, I think, you know, not to get too much into my childhood, but my, my father was an alcoholic, violent, that kind of thing. And I, I didn't have a great childhood because of it. And I grew up very insecure because of it Um, with, you know, people, you know, oh, shut up. Oh, oh, you know, it's just you being crazy. Go somewhere. Like, I I feel like I can never really express myself. And so I think while I've had experiences through my life, they've not been consistent in the everyday sense. And I've never really, when I've gone into something and and I thought I was doing really good, then that sort of negativity would creep in or, or like a, a life event with my father would happen and I would shut down. And I feel like I never really fully connected in the way that I want to or maybe was meant to. And um, and now with, you know, my mother's passing, I, I feel like I've been making peace with, you know, forgiving my father because I'll never get an apology. He has dementia. Like he knows who I am most of the time, but he'll never admit it. He probably doesn't even remember it. And I have to let it go because that's for me, not for him. And, but so as I'm letting go of things and my mother and I had a beautiful moment in the moment that she passed. And that's when I got the notion to get into Reiki. Reiki has been one thing that I can tell you has changed my connection to spirit because I I mostly, because with COVID I've been, you know, mostly doing remote or actually working on my dogs. And I do a lot of work on Raven because she's older and, you know, with her issues and that, but I notice that I am so connected. And when I am connected to other people, you know, doing a Reiki session, I will, I will get messages while I'm doing Reiki. Not a ton of them. Cute little, you know, let so-and-so know that I'm so proud of them. They did this. Tell them I know they did that. It's not like an hour of messages. It's one or two very important things. And and I think because they're respecting that I'm doing Reiki and I'm not really, I'm haven't really been a medium. And, or at least not, you know, a, a medium that I've studied and channeled and put the work in to, to do that sort of work like, like you have done in the past and others have, you know, that's not really been my thing, but everybody tells me it's supposed to be my thing. Everybody tells me, you've told me that. I have. I know I'm smacking myself, <laughs> but, but, and I think that my mother passing opened a door. She, you know what, I don't know if I told you this, but when she passed, She was so out of it and the woman turned her head and her eyes turned and looked right in my eyes and like her hand was just there and I was holding her hand and her hand was just kind of flat. She squeezed and I, and I did not feel that it was just a reaction from what was happening in the meds because she locked eyes with me and she sort of leaned her head slightly forward and gave me that, you know, your mother looks at you like you better listen to me. She looked dead in my eyes. And I heard Reiki reverberate in my head 
and I felt energy leave her body through my hand and it punched me and knocked me. I was on the side of her bed and it knocked me on the floor. And I literally was on my knees holding her hand and throwing myself on her because that at that moment she was passing. Mm -hmm. And I saw her leave her body and I saw her turn and I saw like the disconnect from the human self as a mother watching her children watch her die. I saw her spirit understand the energy of what was happening and the release of, of the human aspect of dying and death and her being embraced into spirit and this look of utter peace on her, on her spirit body. And I could still see her face. It wasn't as plain as her face, but I knew that was my mom. Like I could tell it was still her. And she just looked at me and she just kind of, kind of leaned in again and gave me that, you know what to do. And then just went. And I've never been the same since. And I've had more feelings and experiences and visits and, and experiences with spirit since then. And more so since, you know, I got involved in, in Reiki and it, and I think this is, I think Reiki has facilitated me getting back on the path that I need to be on. Right. Which is the path of light, you know, yes. and <clears throat> one thing about spirit is that spirit is always creative. It's always producing something. It's always offering something utilizable. And the thing I think people do, you know, so many of us have had different types of experiences. We've seen spirits as kids. Maybe we saw energy or felt things. Um, and sometimes that's all we end up focusing on is just that stuff, which I think Jesus called signs and wonders, like just the kind of the rattling around of spirit, like, but why, you know, what's it all about, Alfie? It's when you can take all the experiences and use them for your purpose and then allow something productive and creative to come through as a result of that. And so for me, like, when I was growing up, I had a lot of these different experiences and I didn't understand them. And I was always putting them in the context of religion. But as I'm older now, I, I don't have as many of those knocking around paranormal experiences. The kind of experiences I have are much sweeter, much more profound and meaningful. Like I don't need to have a shadow person show up in my bedroom tonight and he better not because he doesn't want to mess it. Don't please. I'm not the one. <laughs> <laughs> I am not the one, but and don't come I, here because no, I'm, I'm no. trying to have a quiet weekend. <laughs> I mean, but it's like the thing about it is as soon as I realized like, and I occupied my own consciousness, like my purpose, what I'm here to do, my light, my path of light, they're much less interested in me. Spirits are much, much less interested in me because there's not a lot of manipulation a spirit could do. I mean, you can come here cloaked in light and tell me all of these enlightened things, but I will feel you. I will feel yeah. you and like you will know them by their fruit kind of a thing. I, you, your discernment comes online and the integrity is there. And I just, I kind of wanted to cap off like these, these really cool stories with the why of it all. And like, what can I use that? What can I do with that? And how can I use that going forward? And I love that it's healing for you because I feel that so strongly and, you know, I actually wanted to go back to that thing that you did that was bad and caused karma just because you mentioned it and people are curious. But then I don't think we should because <laughs> I, I think it's enough to, to say that everything we do has consequences. Absolutely. And some of those consequences, depending on what we do, can go on for quite some time. But none of us are broken beyond repair. <laughs> it's, we can all get out of the ditch and get back on the street and keep on going, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I will share it with you privately because okay. I do feel that you will have a better understanding of me mm -hmm. and maybe my spiritual stunting for a period. Okay. And, and because I'm still not 100% sure where my path is going. I have an idea of mm -hmm. at least where I'm at now, yeah. but I'm not sure long-term where, where I'm headed. I don't think you need to know though, right? Like I think all we need to do is be as connected as possible and as loving and filled with love as possible. Like, isn't that the purpose at the end of the day? Yeah. The purpose shows up Absolutely. as Reiki or the purpose shows up as teaching. The purpose shows up in different ways, but what it is though is love. Yeah. What it is is light. Yeah, and that always finds the way to wherever it needs to go. Hmm.
Well, right. <laughs> absolutely. I had sure. goosies and I almost for a moment, I started to well up I know, a little well, bit. Me too. Thinking about your mama. Yeah. I have to tell you, let's conclude with this one thing about my mama. Okay. My mom passed, as you know, um, in 2012 and that was terrible. And I miss her and I still miss her. And you talk about your mom and I get all verklempt because our mamas are so special to us. Yeah. Now, after my mom passed, she came right away. Three weeks later, I had a visitation dream and it was so cool because she showed up as the age she was when she passed, but like she had no wrinkles. Her skin was like glass, you know, and it was as if she was lit up from the inside like lamplight, you know, but she was recognizable as the person she was three weeks ago when she passed. But then like one year later, I'm having this dream and I go lucid and I turn and here comes my mom bursting into the room and she's wearing a bikini and go-go boots. She's like 25. She's got her hair back down to her ass like she always used to she always used to wear it. And she's just like, "What's up?" She's partying and she so in the beginning she was presenting after death as an older version of herself, but like she very quickly within a year was rocking that bikini, having just a fantastic time. I remember I asked her like, "So did you see dad?" She's like, I saw your dad. I'm like, well, are you hanging out with dad? And she's like, do you think I'm hanging? She never answers my questions directly. That's I'm awesome. so mad about it because <laughs> I, we made a pact. Like when you leave, you're coming back and you're flashing the lights. You're giving me messages. We're doing the whole thing. And now every time she comes, she helps facilitate the work that I do. But when she visits me and I ask her all the questions that I like, what's heaven like? Oh my God, do you see grandma, grandpa? She's like, do you think I see them? Well, what do you think it's going to be like? Like she never <laughs> answers me directly. I'm like, lady. But I know that she's in a one. If yeah. the bikini is any indication. Oh, absolutely. It's got to be. Place. Your mom's over there partying too. I had I had one. I'll tell you real quick because I knew we got to cut this off. But I, um, I, I was there a week after she passed. I came home. The night that I got home, I went to bed. And I, you know, of course, thinking of my mom, she just passed a week prior. And I didn't feel like I fell asleep, but I'm pretty sure I did. But the next thing I know, the the door, there's a knock at the door and not the doorbell, a knock. And I opened the door and it's my mother. And she said, come out. I went out. I stepped out through the door. We were on the beach and there was a bench and she just took my hand and we sat on the bench. And like, from my point of view, I could see, I was behind us. I could see us. She was here. I was here. And the sun was setting over the water and she just put her head on my shoulder I'm going to, I'm going to lose it. I mean, but that I, I, that I woke up with. And in that moment I said, as much as I want her to visit me every day, <laughs> or at least on holidays and birthdays, I said, if she never comes again, I know in that moment, I, I don't have to worry about anything that I said or did as a kid when I was dumb and an idiot. And, you know, my mother probably didn't like me very much then. I, I know in that moment, nothing mattered. That was my mother's way of saying, nothing matters. I love you. That's it. And I, I, to this day, I see it so vividly. And I don't think I'll ever lose that image. It is just as vivid today as it was a year and a half ago. Well, you know, I'm a teacher. I always want to turn something into a technique. Now you can take the image of that. Okay. That sitting on the bench with your mom's head on your shoulder, looking at the sunset. You can take a, like a Polaroid mind image snapshot of that. And you can actually use that snapshot, that image as a symbol, you know, symbols, you do Reiki yeah. as a symbol to actually connect, to call her. Like you can activate that symbol, that picture to call her, to have a, have an interaction with her, to send her a message or to receive a message like little, like key moments that you remember that, that have that loving resonance and vibration, like actually have making a symbol out of that and then using it as kind of an access point in a communication thing that works, by the way, it works. See, I never thought to try that. Yeah. And another thing I'm going to tell you, you said that happened after a week, a yeah, week after it was a week. your mom was an old soul. And so was my mom. Cause it was only three weeks. And typically it takes a spirit anywhere from three months to three years, just usually based on what mediums say, three months to three years to come on back and do something as um, easy as a visitation dream. That's the easiest way that they can communicate with us. But if your mom's coming back after one week with a visitation and my mom's coming back after three weeks, 
they're old souls. They got over there. They knew exactly where they were. They knew exactly what they needed to do. They didn't need to spend a ton of time in the life review and restoration and climatizing to the fifth dimension. They bopped on out and they came right back. That's cool. So do you feel your mom? Like, do you yes. feel like your mom present with you? Yes. Like she's present I, right now. I feel your mom. I, I, I do too. Yeah. She's right over there. You sweetie. And it's funny because my mother told me that you won't always feel me. You won't always see me. This is when my mother started to have the recollection or the, the idea that she was going to pass. Um, Cause we knew, I mean, now real quick, I'll tell you when, when I was told I was in the car driving home from work, when my brother called me to tell me that she was diagnosed with lung cancer, I flash forwarded a year and a half and I saw my mother laying in a bed. I saw me on the floor holding her hand and leaning on her. I saw my brother directly on the other side. And then to her two friends at the other side, my dad was at home. He was not good for that. I saw it and I heard Kenny Rogers playing and I didn't think of it again. I'm like, get that out of my head. Like I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not putting that out there. And that is exactly what was happening when my mom passed. Wow. So I, I pushed it down. Hence why I got a little thick because I pushed it down as far as I could push it. And it came out. And anytime I think about my mom and get sad, I like blindly just start eating. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, um, one of the things she told me she would do is send Cardinals and, and she said that she would send the cheeseburger bird. I'm not kidding. She said, I will send you the cheeseburger bird in Pennsylvania, sitting out on her deck. We would hear only what, and it was only when I visited her that we would hear this bird. It would say like tweet, but it would go cheeseburger, 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 cheese. Like that's exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> I've never heard that bird here until after my mom passed. And I hear it every single Sunday. Every Sunday, I go outside to take the dogs out, cheeseburger, 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 cheese, and cardinals fly by a lot. So I know that's my mom kind of passing through, but there are times when I'll be in the kitchen and I just, I feel her sort of right there with me. And as I'm going to do something and I'm like, now what did my mother put in it? I'm not even focused. I'm grabbing the ingredient. I'm like, oh, and I think it's my mother guiding me into, you know, making her sauce or whatever it is. So I do feel her a lot, not as much as yeah. I did say six, seven months ago, but enough that it's, it's, it's like semi-annual. Like, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, I just, I, I go through like maybe a week or two and then I'm like, oh, there's mom. Like it just happens and it's a moment, it's a feeling, it's whatever, but I don't really see her that much, but I feel her a lot. Oh. <sighs> Yeah. yeah. Our mamas. We no. miss you mamas. And it's like, so it's so full of suck because I really thought, I really thought it would be more evidential and dynamic, but I think, and I've heard this on different like podcasts, people who do paranormal investigations and stuff. I've heard people say that they think based on EVP and things like that, that spirits really can't say much. Like sometimes there's a connection made with a medium like Arthur Ford or Edgar Casey, where mm -hmm. they can talk about the landscape of the afterlife and give you a glimpse of it. But for the normal person like me and you, just a couple of chumps down here in earth, they can't really divulge how it happens, what's going on in the other side. They're, my mom's very tight lipped and just not as present as I thought she would be. I really thought she'd be more present. And I'm hoping it's not because She's in the process of reincarnation because if there's one thing that woman said is, I will never come back to this prison planet. <laughs> and I said, never say never, mom, because for some reason, when we die, even though we are sure we don't want to come back, for some reason, we're always, we're, we're talked into it when we come on back. I guess because life is beautiful at the end of the day. I guess. I guess because there's really beautiful experiences here. Yeah. And it's, it's well, a good there are. I mean, there are crappy ones too, but then when you think about, but that's part of the journey and that's part of the lessons that we learn. Indeed it is. Brian, thank you so much for hanging out and talking about your cool experiences and also just wrapping it up in, in such a way so that people kind of know what the value of those experiences are and why they're important and how they really do connect us to not just the way the world of spirit works, but our purpose, yeah. like who we are in the world of spirit. Um, can you share with us what you got going on. You got a podcast. I know you do. You got a YouTube channel. Yes. Like tell yes. us about it. So um, my friend Jamie and I, we have a podcast that's called Don't Smudge the Small Stuff. And you can find it wherever you listen to Paul. I will podcast. smudge all the stuff. I'll smudge all the stuff. 
Well, we kind of, we did it as a play on words because it's kind of spiritual centered, but it's like, you don't have to smudge everything, you know, know that there's value. Like we talked today in certain things that may or may not feel great, but there's such a lesson and it gets you to the next level and helps you raise your vibrations. So you can find us on wherever you listen to podcasts, Don't Smudge the Small Stuff with Jamie and Brian. And same thing on YouTube, look for Don't Smudge the Small Stuff with Jamie and Brian. We're just getting started, but we have so much we want to do. And you joined us once and it was fabulous. I did, it was. You guys do have fun. You usually have cocktails, you know, which I approve of. I didn't know you were going to have a cocktail. You know, I would have made one and had one I just you. felt I needed it. The dogs <laughs> were just demanding and I'm like, daddy needs a cocktail. Come on, bring it through. It's fine. <laughs> and so that's what we're doing. Um, we're, you know, hoping to get more content out soon and and really, you know, take this to the next level, but we're, we're having fun and, you know, we would love it for anybody to pop on by and take a listen and subscribe and join us where we're very interactive on our social media. We have Instagram for don't smudge the small stuff and we love to interact with everybody. So come on over. Don't smudge the small stuff. Check it out. It is awesome. And Brian, thank you again. It was such thank a you. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Love you. Yeah, love you too. The Lightshine Development Circle is a sacred place for spiritual seekers to practice giving and receiving readings. The circle is open to all psychics, oracle card readers, mediums, channels, energy healers, Akashic Records readers, and any other type of spiritual practitioner who offers their service via a reading style format. If you're ready to awaken your gifts and talents and fine tune your intuitive abilities, we'd love to have you in the circle.